This is the Critical Therapy Antidote Podcast with your hosts, Yako Fonseil and Christine Stephen. Welcome, everybody, to the Critical Therapy Antidote Podcast. And we are here with the next uh, parent in our series featuring parents surviving the gender cult. So first of all, thank you for coming to the show. It's really a pleasure to meet you and have you here. Mm, Thank you for having me. Yeah, Yeah. it's a pleasure. So we'd like to start by having you tell us a little bit about your daughter. Um, What happened? All right. So I would say that it's a, I would say it's a long road into this because Mm. from when, when it became about gender, it was a long, 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 long way into all the problems that we were experiencing as a family. So it's like, well, how far back do we go? I would say probably to the age of about 10. Mm -hmm. So our daughter now is 16. So we've had about six years of problematic uh, issues that we've, we haven't really solved much of it at all. We still really are firefighting. I think you play a long game in this. Um, Gender obviously was a feature. I mean, I'll say from the outset, we are lucky with our daughter in that she she was in it heavily for a good two years. But since last summer, so what we now, we're now just about spring. So it's been about six months or so where, you know, she's been a lot better, but there's still so much that, still needs to be resolved but because of the world that we are currently living in it's really hard to know who you can trust Mm. with a child who is really living on a knife edge Mm. and so it almost feels like it's best to let her mature in her own time and space in the loving care of her family who obviously know her best and know her story because obviously it's a family story and we all share that yeah so we're just i i guess it's a long game that we're playing it's and we're just trusting that time and knowledge and you know i mean i'm as as mum i suppose i'm i'm probably typical of of many mothers I, I tend to do the the legwork in terms of finding resources, doing the research, you know, just finding out who might be able to help us. Um, and even if they can't help us directly, mm-hmm. as in like speaking to my to to our daughter, mm-hmm. um, I might still be able to implement strategies or approaches that will support her or support right. all of us because yeah. again it's not just about one child I mean yeah um, there's an older sibling an older brother who is still at home he's an adult but um you know he's very invested in his sister's well-being sure. um and obviously there's my husband too you know and he he's kind of again many guys I've noticed of in the parent group that that I'm in you know guys tend to sort of be heads down and just getting on with daily life you know and of course they're supportive but they might not make the time to do the research and read the books and Mm -hmm. watch the podcasts and do Mm. all the do all the things that you do in order to get your head around what this is all about and how your child fits into this whole scenario and what it is that you have to do and there's no one thing it's kind of intuitive led on many fronts I think I mean, I've just read so much. I mean, I can feel all these ideas right now while I'm just, you know, while we get get going, bubbling up inside of me. It's like, well, where do I start? You know, do I start with someone I read? You know, what do I start with, you know, other psychologists or with other gender medicine practitioners? Or do I start with um, someone who takes a really broad view like Jennifer uh, Billick, for example, who you know looks at, at this whole situation as, a, as an industry that our children have got mixed up mm-hmm, in, you know, mm-hmm, quite deliberately. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously not on the children's part. I mean, deliberately on certain yeah. actors within the the whole gender arena. So I would say, so 
as a young child in primary school or elementary school, um, she was very bubbly, vivacious, into everything, really interested in everything, like top student in, you know, her maths and her English and reading and science and art and sport. And she did everything, you know, with these. And she had lots of friends and she was all popular and it all was going great. And then around age 10, everything started falling apart socially. Um, there was bullying in the school. It went both ways, interestingly. I didn't, I kind of suspected it at the time because I knew how kind of, you know, lively she could be. And I didn't think that she would sort of take it lying down. Um, but it got to a point where she was, um, she was injured and I had to take her to the hospital. Okay. And I asked the school about it because the mm -hmm. doctor said she needs an x-ray it was actually um for her arm for like her shoulder because he said it could be broken mm -hmm. and um I mean things had been going on for a while but this was like the pinnacle of like harm physically that was going on and I was aware that she was quite unhappy in the class and had mentioned things like no one's really talking to me at the moment mm -hmm. and you know things weren't great and I had been into the school and talking with the teachers, you know, you just think this is the usual kind of kids, you know, being kids and teachers need to manage this. And they weren't managing it very well. It was a new teacher in that class that year. I spoke to the class teacher. I spoke to the head teacher and both of them basically denied that anything had re even happened. It, they're just, it was just all mismanaged. And I just said, well, if you're not going to deal with this issue, I said, whatever's going on, if you're not going prepared to get to the nub of it then I'm just not going to bring my daughter back to this school because clearly you're not keeping her safe and mm -hmm. that's it you know she's not what coming was, back what was the bullying about um I never really got to the bottom of it okay I mean years later I mean maybe a year or so back when I, my daughter was 15 she did say oh well yeah you know it was kind of I I did you know, I did lash out at somebody and another one of the girls. Um, but it, it was just the school's lack of will to mm -hmm. to get the children to, you know, work out their differences or, I, you know, I, I just don't know. I couldn't yeah. get to the bottom of it. Okay. Mm. And, but all I know is that, you know, I, I just had to keep my daughter safe. And so I found another school. She settled in. Mm -hmm. well in the new school she made good friends again and, and kind of just rolled on and just made a fresh start so she was at that school for a year and then or just over a year and then um, there was the transition to secondary school and she was settled in but by Christmas it was almost like the shine had gone off the new scenario now the the children some of the children from her previous school were in that school in the secondary but what then happened around in that winter she was experiencing a lot of pain in her body and I remember taking her to the pediatrician because what was happening initially she was going to school on the bus and then it was like I can't go on the bus because it was almost like a just everything kind of shut down I mean I didn't really understand it at the time and it's interesting really because like her older brother is on the autism spectrum but mm. his autism and his struggles looked very different from my daughter's struggles and so I didn't at, at that point in time I didn't put two and two together and think possibly my daughter is also autistic mm. yeah at the time I just thought it was all physical and obviously it was having an emotional effect because she couldn't cope with school but yeah she was just emotional she was anxious she 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 was in pain she had all this joint pain and she's hypermobile so we thought perhaps she had Ayla's danlos and we mm. finally got that explored with a rheumatologist but not until she was about 13 mm -hmm. and we had to wait until after the pandemic because of course the pandemic hit mm -hmm. in March but I had actually already withdrawn her from the school which in hindsight I think was a mistake but again you know it's 2020 vision you know in yeah. hindsight um but the school were not really helping. They wouldn't send work home. And it just felt like she was just so desperately sad. And it was just like she'd had this huge, just complete reversal of, of, of personality, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
And again, when we look back, when you know, we talk about it now and we'll sort of say, well, maybe it was some kind of, I don't know, autistic burnout or whatever you want to call it, but something wasn't connecting anymore and she just could not cope with school. So mm. in essence, she was ill for some months and she was in pain and I'd taken her also to an osteopath and he was saying things like, well, when children are in puberty, you know, there's the, the, the growth is really fast. And if you've got like joints that are unstable due to hypermobility, you know, it can be a lot more painful than ordinarily. And, you know, he kind of explained it in a way that made us understand it and understand that, you know, after some months or hopefully not too long, you know, things would settle down in her body and she would feel better and she'd be able to, you know, return to school and feel good again. So, again, we were just sort of reassured, but we're just doing the best we we could and we were homeschooling um, for that period of time. But of course, then the pandemic hit um, in the March and everything closed down. And so there wasn't really, mu you know, much support. And then just things, well, things in the family were difficult because we had decided to move house um, to be closer to our son's college because because of his autism. That's what we did. We moved house and we moved obviously away from everything that our daughter knew. So that was another, if you like, it's like a foundation stone. Right. Our daughter it's don't get in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. Mm -hmm. And by this point, our daughter really was at home, barely leaving the house. Um, and I remember the house that we moved to, she kind of just really got heavily into gaming and mm -hmm. oh. just more gaming, really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it wasn't well moderated for our daughter. And again, you know, you look back and you just think, yeah, we kind of let that go because it was the pandemic and you're trying to, you know, manage, you know, we have a business, my, my, my husband and I, so we're running that and trying to manage all of that, you know, in amongst all the house moves and, mm -hmm. you know, business moves and all the rest of it. So, you know, there was a lot going on. Mm. Just at this point, it is interesting. I, I've written down a few of the risk factors of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Mm. First of all, female, that's a risk factor. Mm. Difficult puberty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Autistic spectrum, autism spectrum disorder. Social challenges. Disruption, moving and COVID. Mm. And thus far, as far as you've told us, a proclivity to withdraw. In the, in the form of gaming. Yeah. So we see yeah. it with rapid onset gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. there's this proclivity to withdraw into fantastic life or to, into the life, into, into a fantasy life. Yeah, that right. is definitely so, what happens. I mean, sh th there are so many do boxes that are being ticked here. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah, so the first house that we moved to, oh, that was the other thing. We were going to move. There was more disruption. So we did move out of that house after a little while, but it was in that first house that mm -hmm. the announcement came. Totally out of the blue. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. But what was the you know, announcement? Was calm. Could, you, could you tell us about what she said? And yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I sort of remember it as clear as day. I can picture her. You know, we're in we're in my room, and you know, she's just kind of lounging on the bed, and she goes, "Oh, um, yeah, um, I'm I'm trans, and um, that means I'm going to need hormones at some point." And, um, and, and, you know, I need to do this as quickly as possible because, you know, if you wait, then, you know, it, the, the, the transition isn't as uh, effective or as, uh, you know, ideal as it could be. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and that, you know, and, and we need to think up a new name, you know, can you help me think of a new name? Wow. So, all so it was just like that, that really, the wow. whole package wow. in one, like, delivery. Yeah. And Isn't it remember interesting? what you were feeling and thinking at that time? I mean, what were your immediate <sighs> thoughts as all mm. of this is coming at you? I just didn't, I just didn't believe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know where it came from. But the crazy thing is it's, it, it, the delivery of it was so polished. I mean, I knew, knew nothing about, I knew nothing about, how children fall into this mm -hmm. all, all I knew was what just you know everyday people know is that there are trans people and we have to be nice to them mm -hmm. and we have to accept right. them sure yeah so that's yeah. all I really had 
but I do remember thinking I didn't I, to be honest I just cannot really remember what I thought other than well I'm listening and you know we'll just see what this is about I, I uh -huh. to be honest I just don't really remember I mean being a parent it's like you're in the moment aren't you with any mm -hmm. situation with mm -hmm. your children and you're dealing with it but you're not necessarily completely embodied yourself mm -hmm. in those moments where you're mm -hmm. you, you have been blindsided but you've got to kind of deliver you know you've got to be there <laughs> you've got to say mm -hmm. something you stay calm I mean I, I just it, I didn't really yeah you know I wasn't going to dissuade her equally I wasn't going to affirm anything it was just like okay this is interesting what's going on here I suppose it was really what was going on in my mm -hmm. head mm -hmm. well I think mm -hmm. I think that is that was such a good response mm -hmm. So what we also see with rapid onset genital dysphoria is they come out, like you said, they they they, they have this trance announcement announcement, mm. and they're scripted. It's very polished, yes. Very polished. Mm -hmm. they, they 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 get very well trained and groomed online. Very well trained and groomed online. And it is interesting to hear that you didn't go into a panic. In other words, your response was a response of survival, and I hope. Parents listening to this, you you need to have a surviving response, not a non-surviving response. A non-surviving response would be panic and crumbling and falling apart, and which would also be understandable. But that would, but you, what that would signal to the to the to the child is, your announcement has just overwhelmed me so much, and I can't handle you. Mm -hmm. As I say, it was shocking, but I didn't crumble certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't crumble in front of her mm -hmm. right and I right. probably took a couple of days before I actually told my husband because I did need to process it by myself to be able yeah. to figure out well how am I going to present what my daughter's just brought to to me mm -hmm. to him because I, I suppose you know I know my husband inside out we've been together in many many decades and um you know, we, I mean, we've got older children too. We, you know, they're in their oh. late twenties. So, you know, we've we've been parenting a long time. Mm -hmm. I know that you know when you get to know yourself and get to when you face up to your issues or you face up to your challenges or just face up to you know if you like be curious even not even face up to but just be curious about yes why do you find something difficult you know what is it about a certain scenario that f makes you afraid or makes you, you know, retreat or whatever, whatever response you have to a certain challenge in life. You know, when you get curious about that and figure out what that is and then, you know, find your answers and then start to think about, well, how do I solve those issues? You know, how do I approach this mm -hmm. in a new way so that I can mm -hmm. succeed at something that I want to do? You know, so that, that's what I'm saying. I, I, you know, I mentioned my other children because, you know, we all can draw lessons from the experiences yeah. of all our children and we can all, yes. you know, kind yeah. of apply that then maybe a little bit to our other kids as well. Or at least, you know, we can talk about those things. Mm -hmm. That's a very anti-fragility approach, a resilience building approach to not just resort to withdrawal or, or, or seeking out comfort as opposed to figuring out what you need to do so as to muster up the courage gain the necessary skill to gain mastery over the thing that is mm. actually standing in your way. Um, and sadly, the the default response of, of many people these days is to seek out alternatives, easier alternatives, as opposed to gaining that mastery over the thing they need to, mm. they, they need to overcome. Mm. So your response was an anti-fragile or a resilience mm -hmm. focused response. When you said, be curious, think about this thing. What do mm -hmm. I need to improve on in order to overcome whatever is in front of me? Yeah, and I suppose, well, I model that. I don't expect my youngest daughter to listen to me if I say things like that. I'm, I might mm. I might not say it in that way to her. Um, because, I mean, she's of an age... And certainly between the eight, so she was 13, by the way, when she gave me that announcement, she was 13 yeah. and a half. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd had, a, we'd had a while, hadn't we, you know, from those initial, you know, 
difficulties with social interaction yeah. and then the bullying and then the not being well and then the retreat from school and then the kind of shutdown and yeah. really refusal to participate in life whatsoever. So when we moved in the winter, we did have her restart at school. Her pains had pretty much gone away. Physically, she was much better. We were aware that mentally and emotionally she was still very fragile, but mm. we had enlisted um, a, a child psychologist to support her. She'd seen her a couple of times. And, you know, she was kind of on standby to assist with, mm -hmm. like, the whole kind of getting back into school. And we'd also spoken to the GP, so our, our family doctor. And, um, you know, our family doctor was also aware that, you know, there was some extra support needed. And I think we were already talking about um, getting some kind of assessment for autism or ADHD or mm -hmm. whatever neurodevelopmental issues were going mm -hmm. on because we could tell that something wasn't right. Right. And the GP agreed with that. And the psychologist also could, could see that there was some issues with, you know, communication and that sort of thing. So we had already got kind of some stuff in place, you know, regarding school and support. Um, so she started school in the winter, in the January. And as I say, from January to June, she had started school quite well. She'd gone back in until about April, again, about three months or so she had managed to attend fairly well and then about from Easter onwards the attendance dropped off again and by June she was barely going into school and that's when we got the trans announcement so if you kind of mm -hmm. there's the timeline mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. her behavior and then what mm -hmm. happened with that announcement I think maybe she went to school maybe one or two more days after that and that was it it was almost like she had spilled this out to me and it was like well this is kind of an announcement that I mean, when I look back, and I mean, I, I do keep a journal, I do remember writing about this whole thing. And I, I was aware she had been telling me about a child in her class who, when I look back, I realised this was a girl who was trans identified and had moved schools to start in a new school, the school that my daughter was in, as a boy. And... The friendship group included this individual, this trans identified girl. And, you know, I remember being quite curious myself about the girl and I would ask my daughter about her and, you know, and the friends that she was making. And when the trans announcement came, I thought, ah, there's the influence. It's mm -hmm. come through school. Mm -hmm. And I asked the school about it. Now I'd, I'd had quite, I was by that point having quite a lot of conversations, certainly weekly with her head of year who was very good. He was a good, he was a good listener. And I'm not saying he was a bad teacher. He, he was a good teacher. However, when I talked to him about the trans identification and said, Oh, you know, you know, this, she's talking to me about this, you know, kind of identifying as trans and not really sure what to make of it. You know, I said, I think that, you know, I'm aware there's another child in the class, you know, that she's friends with. I said, you know, I don't know if there's, you know, if, if it's just influence or what, what's going on. And he just said he was so blasé. And this was what really kind of, that was really when the alarm went off. He mm. was just blasé. He was just like, oh, well, all the kids are talking about it these days. Mm. It, it, it just didn't bother him in the least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's because everything like, but a well, minor issue. It's a huge issue, issue mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if my child doesn't identify as herself any longer, clearly something is amiss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he did not see that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm not going to get any help from this school. So there we are. So I wasn't getting any help from them. And then so what happened was we then, then the summer break happened and um, family life was quite stressful we moved again but um still in the same area so she could still stay go back to that school if she wanted to but she made out that if she was going to have this new trans identity she would have to go to a new school mm. because she couldn't go to the old school where they knew her as a girl and mm. she would come out with all these stories of oh well if i go as a trans person i'm going to get beaten up and the cis boys will uh they hate trans girls uh, trans you know trans boys um, you get mixed up yourself don't you with all the terminology yeah. yeah but you know they they hate trans people and I will get beaten up and so because she was so clear in her mind that this would happen 
that fed into her whole anxiety loop. Yeah. And I couldn't argue with that. There was nothing, there was no way I could, I mean, I did try, I would get her to put her uniform on and I would take her up to the school and then she would just sit in the car and she would not get out. And we tried that a few times. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so many times you can put your child and yourself through that because it starts to become what actually in my family we call a set piece. Mm. A set piece is, you know, like it's almost like you've performed it so many times that everybody yeah. knows what their role is. It's like being on stage. It starts to become, yeah. feel like a yeah. performance. You're just going through the motions of something. You, you know what the outcome is going to be and it's not yeah. going to be <laughs> successful. So you just get to a point, you go, well, there's absolutely no point doing this, you know. Just if she had changed her appearance by this point after her announcement, had she, had she done anything? Yeah, she got me to cut her hair. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So she wouldn't go to a hairdresser, but she did ask me to cut all her hair off. So that was tough. Had she, but... had she socially transitioned? Had she announced herself as a boy by that time um, with her friends and with, with, yes. the, with the peers at school? Yeah. I mm -hmm. see. It's interesting, the, um, the in induction of threat. And that is the other trick that the activists um, pull is they, oh, yeah. they, would, they would tell these, these kids that the world is going to be hostile. Mm. the cisgendered kids the cisgendered people are hostile there's a lot of mm. transphobia so expect yes. these things and so they're very attuned oh, yeah. to, to absolutely to minus slides that. that's the one thing and the other thing is you've, they they encourage them to transition even medically transition as quickly as possible otherwise they would commit suicide so that's the other threat oh yeah, yeah we haven't even got mm. to that yet have we okay <laughs> oh my goodness yeah, yeah there are so many layers to this a couple of weeks later and remember it was early july and i noticed her wrist her arm mm. and she had been I, I can i can be specific here can't i i mean like she she had cut herself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not once not twice I would say there was probably 15 marks oh all God. the way up the inside of her wrist. Mm. Yeah. And they would all they were not deep, but they were healing. Yeah. Again, it's that almost you dissociate yourself. You almost again, you it's like you're doing your mum performance mm -hmm. and you're keeping it together. But equally you've got to with your voice. And with the way, you know, your demeanor towards your child, you've got to be really firm, yes. but, yeah. but quiet. It's kind of a quiet firmness. It's like, okay, I see what we're dealing with. <laughs> you know, you don't say that, but that's kind of what you're showing them. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I see what you're doing. This is what we're going to do. And I just mm -hmm. took her in hand and I said, okay, I said, I can see what's going on here. We're going to have to talk about this. I said, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to go and see the doctor about this. I said, because, you know, clearly you know, we, we need some help with uh, how we, we're going to do this. Said, so, but th this cannot continue. I said, mm -hmm. I, and I asked her there and then, I said, so what have you been using? She told me, I said, okay, so th those that's going in the bin now. And it was a, it was a razor blade that she had, you know, mm -hmm. um, been using. Right. So safeguarding um, measures. Takes, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just, you know, we got rid of the sharp mm -hmm. and um, that went in and I made her put it in the bin. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. do it. I, she had to do it. Mm -hmm. you know but I was with her when she did that mm -hmm. and again I mean I I mean none of my other children have done any of this stuff so you know this to me was extreme but equally I just I just we just dealt with it and do you know what it, it didn't happen again it was just done and dusted and I, okay. and, she, and I said well why what you know what made you think to do this you know what are you getting out of it you know I was curious and she just said well I'm depressed this is what depressed children do. There was no real emotion, to be honest, in her mm. behind it. It was almost like she she literally, I mean, this is, I suppose, what you get with a child who's autistic but has been masking it. Yeah. Yeah. And, not, and then you realise that, yeah, they will read things and think, oh, that it, literally, this is what depressed people yeah. are doing because I feel depressed. This is what I must do. I mean, it yeah. was it is that literal. Mm-hmm. And I would check on her afterwards, you know, for a few weeks afterwards, just to, you know, quietly, but obviously as well. I would just mm -hmm. sort of gently just, 
you know, just while I'm with her, just pull up her sleeve very quickly and just check. And she'd be like, oh, what are you looking at? And I was just saying, yeah, you're okay still. That's great. You know, and so just, but right. we, only for a couple of months after, just to check mm -hmm. that she had not mm -hmm. resumed and, and she was fine. But the, the, the suicidality thing was definitely there. And I think, I mean, I remember after the, the cutting, she did tell me that walking home from school, she literally wanted to walk out into the road under the traffic. Mm. And that was quite alarming for me to hear. Mm -hmm. So, and again, you know, we talked to the doctor about that. And, you know, he in the meantime was um, trying to get uh, referrals to what we have here in the UK, which is CAMS, the, the um, yeah. Child and Adolescent, uh, what is it? Mental health Mental services. Mental health services, yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you, mm -hmm. you refer to things being as literal as that. And I think that is valuable yeah. because when, when someone has this proclivity to be very concrete in their thinking, it is very difficult to deal with emotional stuff since emotions are abstract. They, they, they're difficult to conceptualize. And with autism, mm -hmm. we know that there is a difficulty to what we call symbolize. So we see that there is this 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 literal use of language. They they're very susceptible to the influence by the trans activists, and they want something to fix. And it's so much easier to resort to something as concrete as your body. To want to fix something as your body, and if you fix your body, then your depression and your suicidality will evaporate, will go away, and that is the promise. Mm -hmm many of these activists sold out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is not what we see. That is not what the research shows, and that is not how we formulate body image disorders. Even though the person presents as my body image, my size in anorexia nervosa, my limb in apotemnophilia, that is body integrity identity disorder, in false pregnancies, etc. Even though they would mention something of the body as the reason for their distress. What actually, what's actually going on is the person has a pre-existent mood disorder and in an attempt to reduce the, the anguish, they target the body. They turn on the body as the target of the issue. And with responsible medical and psychological intervention, that can be addressed to rather look at the underlying anxiety, autism, defensive depression. structures, depression, maybe even trauma. She was bullied, remember, and address those things. Those are the actual target of things that need to be addressed, as opposed to displacing the distress onto the body. And that is the, the strategy they resort to instead. Exactly. Because and, and it because it is such a literal thing, you know. They've been literally told to focus on the body as something yeah. to fix. I mean, mm. autistic folk they they have it becomes a special interest. I do remember her showing me a page online, and it was a, a chart of all the different. I, I mean, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it must have been like a chart of all the different genders, and all the different um, different sort of sexualities. You know, a gender and whatever and I, but I was just like oh okay well interesting well I, th I said I I looked at, at the chart and I remember saying well I think in my day you know when I was growing up when I was your age you know we just had different terminology for all of this stuff I said look you know the, there's an awful lot of labels here isn't there you know I sort of just mm -hmm. sort of made light of it yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and where where was she in her kind of transition process at this point so we know she cut the hair was she, she cut dressed, the hair, was she, she had the new name. Which she, she had the new name yeah. at this point. Okay. She had the new name, which she was asking us to use. And, uh -huh. But I was like, I said, well, okay, we can try the name for a bit. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, but I might keep, I might, I will probably keep forgetting. I said, and mm -hmm. I certainly know your dad will forget. Mm -hmm. I said, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll use it, I guess, occasionally. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there was a little bit of social transition through one side of the family, i.e. my side of the family. Mm -hmm not my husband's okay my daughter said right from the beginning she goes my other grandparents will not understand this so don't bother them with it i'll just be my normal name with mm -hmm. them always mm -hmm. you don't have to talk to them but we only used it for a little while mm -hmm. and i never changed the pronouns i just i just said i can't do that 
I said, mm-hmm. I gave birth to a daughter, I'm sorry, but I, mm-hmm. that's not something I can do at this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Learning the art of compromise is a skill that we need to get through life. I have to say the way that you, you handled this was oh, well. incredible from the very yes. beginning up until the point that we are in your story now. It's yeah. amazing. Thank you. I've, nobody's ability... given me any feedback. You signal to her that you notice what she's t- trying to tell you. You have a very soft approach, mm-hmm. but you have your boundaries very clear and very firmly in mind. Mm-hmm. And the way you went about was, um, okay, maybe I will use the name, but remember, I will forget and your dad will keep forgetting. And the other family will certainly not go along with it. What you did there was you indicated to her that you will remain anchored in the world of reality. You will remain anchored. Your your your, your dad will forget. It is what it is. And no pronouns. And, mm-hmm. and that is significant because as mm-hmm. soon as we start to overhaul their mental world, and we go along with this fantasy. We contribute to the unmooring. Mm. You know, I, I'm well grounded, well, well, well experienced in helping um, guide a, an autistic child. You know, an autistic boy mm-hmm. at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is very different with a girl. Yes. Especially when they fall into mm-hmm. this particular trap, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I guess I, well, I suppose, yes, I didn't overreact. I did keep a cool head and I was just trusting that. I mean, the fact is she had no other real influences other than what she was seeing online. And I mean, I was always aware of what she was doing online as much mm-hmm. as you can, even though, of course, you, there's a lot you don't know because, of course, you know, the door is sometimes shut. One time she had fallen asleep um, with the computer on one night and I did find the laptop open and I wiggled the mouse. And I do remember she had been in some kind of chat room and mm. somebody had asked for photographs. Mm. And I was appalled, mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. appalled at, that this could go on. You know, you read about this stuff, but you never think it's going to happen to you. It's that mm-hmm. classic mm-hmm. situation. And then it's there in front of you and you cannot mm-hmm. avoid it. You cannot deny it. It has happened to your child. Now, I could tell from the conversation, she had not given anything. She had been really firm, and that was fantastic. But, of course, knowing this, I had to talk to her about it. And I said, you know, well, this is great that you didn't, but, you know, you realise that, you know, these sorts of conversations, you must shut them down immediately. In fact, you shouldn't be in these places at all, yeah. you know. And and but and then she would was able, though, also to explain, well, these these people are stupid and silly. And, you know, yes, I know. Absolutely. They shouldn't ask me for this stuff. And, you know, they're, they're just silly men. You know, why? Why would I? I definitely wouldn't, you know. And she was very disparaging and, you know, but but at the same time, you feel sad that your child has had an experience like this an interaction Mm -hmm. like this which is totally inappropriate Mm -hmm. Um, and you feel that their childhood has been robbed from them this is real you know and you have to be careful and so I mean now you know obviously she's older and I mean I know she's not in those spaces Mm -hmm. at all Um, but you know again it's just knowing that the internet is a a place full of predators Mm -hmm. yes Um, and she has learned that yeah. First hand. You see, in olden days, I, 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 I like to relate this. In olden days, our society was smaller to begin with. And many mm. of us grew up in smaller cities and smaller towns. And our parents had an idea, even ourselves, we had an idea of who the troublemakers in the neighborhood, mm. at school, in town were. Mm. And parents used to warn us, you don't mix with those children. I don't want you to mix with those children. And I will, I will follow up. I will speak to some of your friends and I will even f- phone the school and tell them I don't want my child to mingle with, mm-hmm. a, with, with that child or the other children. That's That served as a, a form of, of, of slight control to protect your child against age-inappropriate exposure to things mm-hmm. that could potentially traumatize them mm-hmm. psychologically. Now we do not have those strongholds anymore with internet. And children get exposed to things that um, 
that are not age uh, age appropriate and there are many predators mm -hmm. out there and activists out there who whose mission is to target these children that's just mm -hmm. the reality of the risks we're dealing with these days parents need to take ownership mm -hmm. of their responsibility also around screens and screen time and what their children are exposed to online and that is one of the most significant i would say the the the, the heaviest factors or risk factors contributing to rapid onset gender dysphoria mm -hmm. is this yeah. grooming that they receive online mm. I mean, ultimately, we want our children to feel safe in the world. We don't want yeah. them to grow up thinking that there's a predator on every corner, or there's a predator no. you know, every time that they're going to go online and have to fend them off. But yeah, I mean, she she's just very matter of fact about it. Mm. But it makes me sad as a parent to think mm. that my child has had to kind of become matter of fact about something that's so obnoxious, mm. actually. Um, and then what continued to happen from that point um, going up until where we are today? Okay. So she wouldn't go back to school in the autumn, mm -hmm. um, but she remained on roll because um, I was wise to the fact that if I took my child out of um, school, you know, did the home officially home education again, I would get zero help. And I needed to get an assessment done mm -hmm. for her potential autism. So we got an assessment begun it, there was a lot of delay but finally it did happen um a whole year later took a whole year of waiting so she was basically out of school with zero input the school would not help so this is the same school that didn't yeah. care that she would be trans identifying didn't give a hoot but um what was interesting was we had to actually go to a judicial like a they call it a, uh, not judicial review but it's like a basically a judge has to mm -hmm. look at the case because the the county would not help us they mm -hmm. said no you can't have an assessment so we had to go to a judge and the judge it was wonderful because the judge came back and said that the, both the school and the county where we live had both um, failed in their duty of care towards our daughter. Yeah. And that was wow. gratifying. That's very validating. Yeah. I was, yeah. I, I mean, it was so obvious. I mean, yeah. how do you just ignore a child for an entire year? Yeah. You know, I, you know, I could be quite rude about these people. Um, yeah. But anyway, it was really nice to have a judge, somebody independent, look at the case and go, you know what, you have failed this child. And so, yeah, the um, the assessment was then ordered by the judge and the assessment took place finally. It still took a few more months for that to be organised, but that was because of funding and all the usual excuses. Mm -hmm. And so since we've been in our new home with the, assess the initial assessment that was done, it was mostly, it was actually an educational psychologist who did the mm -hmm. assessments. It wasn't yeah. for autism, but it was for her educational needs. And so that was quite specific. And she was also seen by... As part of that assessment, she was seen by um, an occupational therapist and mm -hmm. occupational therapists are wonderful practitioners. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are looking at the body. Yeah. They're looking at interoception. They're looking at your proprioception. They're looking yeah. at all your senses and how your you as an individual makes sense yes. of your yeah. world through your senses. And this is actually a key point that I would like to point out as a parent now, I've been aware of this for some time because my older daughter, sorry, my older son being autistic, he was also assessed at the age of 10, 11 by occupational therapists. I honestly think if we had like 10 times the number of occupational therapists out there mm. looking at these children mm -hmm. and figuring out because they, they are trained to notice the things that you know yeah. we ordinarily might not notice but they notice them and they log it all and then they can put together a plan to get your child integrated into their own body and being able to make sense of their emotions and their experiences and actually you know over time you know with with the therapy you can you know if you're on a program you can have a child that can actually interpret the world so much better. And autistic kids really, really, really need this help. Yeah. Now, we don't have enough of them here in this country. My child, unfortunately, has not had the benefit of that. She just had the mm. assessment done. Therapy has not been forthcoming, and that's mm -hmm. not something we've been able to get, get right. for her. But I'm aware how it could potentially help her. I did um, get in touch. Well, in fact, I, 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 we 
we did we had the program i don't know if in the state it's actually in the state so you guys are probably aware of it brain balance mm. um the brain balance program which is mm. basically occupational therapy um i'm just trying to look at the book the original the originator of it was um dr robert was it pronounced melillo i think but it's okay. been um he wrote a book it's called disconnected kids and there's um it's, he yeah. calls it the groundbreaking brain brain balance program for children with autism adhd dyslexia and other neurological disorders but essentially <laughs> it's occupational therapy mm -hmm. and it's integrating all your senses to make better sense of your world and your experience of living I have read quite a few books. Uh, yeah. I've read the one he by Helen Joyce, um, Trans, and a Miriam Grossman's mm. book I'm working yes. through. I haven't finished that one yet. Um, there's so, there is a lot of information out there, and obviously in, with the parent group that I've been with, I've learned an awful lot. Yeah. Um, and it was really through that that I realised just how crucial it is that more people understand what on earth is going on with, with yeah. these children yeah. and with our families. Do not react out of panic. Mm -hmm. Keep thinking. Mm -hmm. And that is what you've been yeah. doing. Mm -hmm. You continue. Yeah. I mean, I've thinking. been lucky with my daughter in that we have not panicked. We have been quite systematic. As I say, coming back to our story, we, we moved, we got here, we got the education plan in place through the assessment. Um, I joined the, the parent group, mm -hmm. the support group, Our Duty. And um, they have been instrumental in yeah. helping me figure out the game plan. Because if you like, I've been working with my intuition. I had not really given much away. I read the CAST report. That was the first thing I did after I joined our duty. Or the, yes, the most important parts mm -hmm. of it. To the point where I understood that essential phrase, social transition is not a neutral act. Mm -hmm. Now, no. once you've... Once you understand what mm -hmm. that, that means, then you know what to do. Yes. And what is that? And then, well, <laughs> you don't social transition. You sit your That's child down, which is what I did. Yeah. Yes. With yes. my husband, I basically called a family meeting. Yeah. So, Beautiful. So my, my, my husband and I, obviously, we talked to our duty and we were onboarded. And then... We did a bit of reading and I said, right, we're going to have a family meeting and we're going to sit our daughter down with our son as well. All four of us, we're going to have a cup of tea. We're going to have some biscuits and we're going to have a chat. And that's what we did. And we chatted for about two hours. Wow. And so we batted the whole thing around for quite a while, because as you can imagine, when she was told that we were no longer going to use this uh, new name. And, you know, and I explained why. And I said, well, there's this top pediatrician this top doctor who understands children you know in the country and she has done a report there's going to be more to come I said but in essence she is saying that social transition is not a neutral act and then we explained what that means so in other words it's not a good idea mm -hmm. what I said was we are responsible parents we love you mm -hmm. and we support you Mm -hmm. And we understand you are going through a tough time right now. I mm -hmm. said, it's not even about a gender thing. I said, there's so much else going on in your life and in your mind. I said, we, we you know, but we are here for you. We are going to support you as your family. But ultimately, we are responsible for your safekeeping until you become an adult. Yeah. And so part of that is using your original name. Yeah. Yes. I said, and I said, I know we haven't used it for a few months. I said, and it's going to feel a bit strange to use it again for all of us. I said, that's fine. I said, we'll get used to it bit by bit. I said, but that is what we're going to do. This this new name is not going to be used anymore. I said, I will explain it to your grandmother. And I said, and I'll explain it to your sisters. I said, you don't have to tell them anything. I will, I will tell them and I will tell them why. And so that's what we did, mm. you know, and she was disappointed i think but she didn't fight about it after we'd had mm. that conversation and we didn't use her original name like to her face for a while what we did was we would talk about her 
in front of her but like not actually call her her name we just use pet names you know mm -hmm. sweetie or you know sweetheart or you know whatever mm -hmm. pet names sure. come up come up you know my, I mean, my my husband never knew uses any of the children's names anyway it's a it's a it's a long standing <laughs> joke in the family he only used his nicknames and he of course is this long string he has a long string of nicknames for each and every child that have they kind of morph as they get old you know they start he starts out with a baby <laughs> nickname then there's the toddler nickname then there's the there's the nickname that occurs when they're really naughty little children there's that one uh -huh. and there's the one where they're quite cute again do you know what I mean he's he's yeah. had so many names for all the kids yeah. so of course he just you know defaulted oh, which to be honest he'd been using those names anyway because he never uses the kids names so yeah, it was it was fine, really. And I would say after about a month to six weeks, I could use I could actually call her for dinner with her original name. Oh, but I didn't yeah. do it right away. Yeah. You, you've got to be sensitive. Yep. Yes. You can't bludgeon your way into this. Beautiful. I think you've done. But, a but, but we were firm. Job. And of course, we were a lot more strict with the phone. We did take the phone away for about yeah. two months. We just yeah. binned it. And we restricted internet massively. Yeah. And Beautiful. Tremendous. Internet restrictions are still there. They have been relaxed as she's got older. I mean, she's 16 now. But of course, we keep conversation open. And she knows that I might change her on something she's watching or a game she's playing or whatever. But chances are I'm actually not going to come in and challenge it. I'm actually going to come in and see what she's doing and I'll get involved. So that's yeah. the other key thing yeah. that I yeah. did. You've answered what our last questions were going to be, which is what advice would you give to parents? And so beautifully, you've just shared what you did. And the, the, yeah. that's, that advice is golden. I mean, it's, it's well, really. But it's, it's not it's just tremendous. that. It's not about what you're taking away, though, mm -hmm. Christine. It's yep. not just about what you take away because then you just create a void. Absolutely. You've got to fill it with something. And so actually what we've done in a way, although we did take stuff away initially just because we said, look, our lifestyle has to change and you know we've got to really focus on each other and focus on our family life and, yeah. and we had only just moved and so we could give our attention fully to our daughter you know mm -hmm. she still wasn't in school but at least she had a plan all these things were good and we were making sure that every weekend we were going out as a family even if it was just like for a nice walk you know we'd, we'd we, I would pack up a, like pack up a picnic and yeah. we'd go to the beach for the evening and watch mm -hmm. the, the moon come up over oh, the sea. Beautiful. So, you know, we'd go down there and set up the tripod and take these amazing pictures amazing. of the moon rising or yeah. the sun setting or whatever. And just kind of just have spontaneous family time. And mm -hmm. the nice thing with the beach is it's remote. So there's not really any uh, any uh, kind of Internet. So mm -hmm. you can take your phone, but you're not going to get any signal. So that's great. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. so basically get unplugged yes. get out into life get your kid moving as much as possible she still yeah. isn't coming up the gym with me but yeah um you know it, we saw the initial signs I mean we told her in the January no more old name back yes. to our original name and really by April May I was already seeing a shift in her like her hair was growing yeah, that's incredible. She wasn't asking me to cut it anymore. Yeah. And then, but by August, that was when it happened in the, there was the big reveal and it was amazing. We were going for like a, a show. And um, so she was, she, we told her to get ready, you know, and she came down to the stairs and this was in August. So it was during the summer holidays and she had put on this amazing outfit. I didn't even know that she's had this skirt but like, and then she'd put on the tights and she'd put on these boots and she'd put on a top and she had put on some makeup and she looked incredible. Wow. And honestly, my jaw hit the floor. It was just like, oh my goodness. But again, didn't respond, <laughs> <laughs> held it together. Yeah. And I just went, nice boots. Yeah. And that's all I said. This is such a good story. Yes, it really and, is. Um, there are so many good points to this story, but I think to be the master of the moment, to take the time to think, to remain curious, to not panic, to inform yourself of what is available around responsible care for gender confused children and to reclaim, to reclaim your responsibility as parents. Yep. Firm boundaries. With 
Burn Boundaries, you did so well to, to, to reintegrate as a family. Mm -hmm. And look at that. Mm -hmm. This is such a heartwarming story. And I'm so happy for all of you. Thank That's you. really incredible you. what you've I mean, accomplished. We talked to a lot of parents. We talked to a lot of a lot of people in all areas of this. And um, I have to say, this is one of the stories that stays with me the most. Mm. Just because you followed your, you know, you followed your intuition. You didn't have any professional help necessarily, but everything that you did, I mean, it came from the heart and it came from the right place. And this is, mm. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine, you could write a handbook for parents after this yeah. experience you've been through. Mm. That's how incredible what you did really was. And it may have mm. felt intuitive to you, but there are so many people out there that are, are, they don't know what to do. They don't know if to look up, down, left, right. They're completely lost. And for as mm. lost as maybe you may have felt, I mean, at any given point, what you did um, was really create a place for your daughter to start her path toward healing. Yes. Well That's done. Amazing. Yeah. It's not just my daughter. It's your family. It's all of us. It's all, all of, of us. You. you know, I mean, you have to create a space, don't you, for healing, yeah. whether that's going to a, 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 a psychologist's office, yes. you know, that's a space for healing. Okay. Um, we've had to create it within our home because yeah. – there is no safe space at the moment that we can access. I'm not yeah. saying it doesn't exist, but we haven't been able to access it yeah. for various reasons. Um, but we have, I think, been able to create it at home. Yeah. You're right. I keep acknowledging that, actually. That's, that's really lovely. I haven't thought of it in that way. I have been attentive to my own emotional needs and my mm -hmm. own healing needs. Mm -hmm. I've just simply um, attended to my emotional needs through things like breath work yeah. and yoga enabling me to stay um, calm and to process anything that's going on. I would encourage all parents to find ways that help them deal with the stress of it because the stress of dealing with this situation is ongoing. It's relentless. It does not let up, yeah. you know, don't feel you've got to do this alone, you know, do yeah. find what, what will support you and fill your own well because yes. it's, you know, the, the child, the children really do demand a lot of you. Well, thank you so much uh, for giving us your time and, and the space to really be mm -hmm. able to dive into your story. Thank Absolutely. you very much for the work that you all do as well. Thank you.